there's there's been we've known about you know global warming for 30 years the climate crisis has been very astoundingly clear for the last 10 the science is there yet the action in our wider society isn't seen and that's happened for a myriad of reasons but one of them is that a kangaroo fern production welcome Welcome to to gorilla podcast fresh eyes the beat that makes you feel good A weekly podcast that features interviews with social change leaders or individuals that aims to bring audiences good stories to motivate their own social impact efforts. Now, here's your host. Welcome to Guerrilla Podcast, Fresh Eyes. This episode, we're talking about climate change. It's a different topic right now. So are we really in the middle of um, an ecological crisis? From this episode... We're gonna talk to one of the environmental group that is getting much media attention this year. So we know there's a lot of environmental organization like Sea Shepherd, Greenpeace. Why this group is different? Why they're doing a different strategic so that government and other people know what's really happening to our environment and also to our forests or everything. So please welcome Jamie Dan from, you know, Extinction Rebellion. Is that right? Extinction Rebellion. How you take? Um, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Matt. It's good to be here. So as of there's a lot of happening in in the media as well and most of it is talking about what happened in london the extinction rebellion doing in london disrupting even in south australia you do you have spring rebellion so what is spring rebellion what is that Hmm. so extinction rebellion um we work on a, a kind of six month timeline often where there will be peaks of intense activity followed by a lull in activity to be able to regenerate, recuperate and train more rebels, okay. um, more people into our organisation. So the Spring Rebellion was our week of action. Um, it happened a couple of weeks ago okay. um, in October and yes, yeah, a week of sustained action. So what is Extinction Rebellion or XR for short? So Extinction Rebellion, we're an organization, maybe I can explain the name and that will help, okay. um, help, to, un- yep. help to understand what, what Extinction Rebellion is about. So the extinction part of Extinction Rebellion is basically a recognition that we are living through the sixth mass extinction. Mm-hmm. There is a huge amount of um, diversity being lost, lots of species disappearing forever off the face of our planet. Um, and that, that's due to a lot of things. That's due to climate change which is our number one priority. Extinction Rebellion is mm-hmm. here as, as we are also facing an existential human threat due to climate change. There is a possibility that human, the human beings on this planet won't be able to survive climate change in the, the cat- catastrophic climate change that could occur mm-hmm. if we don't change our course. Um, but not only that, there is a huge amount of extinction that will occur through the climate crisis and climate change, runaway climate change, in the natural world and the ecosystems that we'd lose would be extensive. And I, I, I don't think that it's worth that mm-hmm. just so that we can continue dry, driving petrol cars instead of electric cars or whatever the case may be, you know? Surely it's worth us reorienting the way we do things so that we can leave our beautiful coral reefs and our natural rainforests in the pristine you know, way that they currently are. So what are the demands of Extinction Rebellion? What are the Mm. main demands? Mm. So it's very simple. We have three demands. Mm -hmm. One of them is to uh, tell the truth. So that first demand is about government and our, um, you know, power power holders in society. So media media groups and corporations Mm -hmm. telling the truth about the climate science. Act- and acting as if that truth is real. So really being clear about the climate emergency that we're in. The science is saying that we've got 10 years to shift our, our way of doing things and to stop mm-hmm. polluting. Um, otherwise, 
natural feedback mechanisms will kick in, tipping points will be hit, Mm -hmm. and suddenly as the Arctic sea ice melts, all of the methane gets released. Mm -hmm. That methane is going up in the atmosphere no matter what we do at that point. Mm. So there are real moments where we lose control Okay. And lose the ability to maybe mitigate climate change and actually bring it back from a full hothouse Earth scenario, which would mean huge, you know, catastrophic levels of diversity loss and potentially human extinction. Mm. All right. So you get, say, you get three demands to, so that the government. Yep. So sorry. Then, yeah. Demand number one. Yeah. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. Demand yeah. number two. We want all governments to commit to net zero emissions by 2025. Um, so that means that all pollution that goes up must come down in any way, shape, or form that it does Mm -hmm. um, by 2025 and that we work towards that in the interim years. Um, And then finally, that we have a citizens' assembly, basically a form of direct public democracy that has legal control over the way that the climate crisis will be dealt with. So we're not saying that the, like the government still exists in its current form. All we're saying is for, on the climate change issue, we don't trust governments to be able to act in an efficient and an, an uncorrupted way. Mm-hmm. There are many vested interests and many ways that those vested interests can intervene in our current political system to um, dis- derail the action that we need to be taking. So our, our third demand is all about saying that fundamentally at the end of the day, the people themselves have that legal control over what will be done and in that legal con- the, the people consist of 300 or so randomly six less selected people or honestly that's actually under construction mm-hmm. but some amount of people randomly you know taken from the population as a full representative sample of the australian people taken through a critical analysis of what the, the potential solutions mm-hmm. are you know kelp farms or solar energy or whatever those, Mm -hmm. you know, all of those various solutions that we have to the climate crisis that are out there at deciding which ones fit Australia the best and which ones are going to deliver the best results and then creating that plan and giving that to government. And that's the, that's the plan that government does fundamentally. So you're saying the second demand is about the government to take action. Yeah. So if you got, if you imagine the first demand is about them realizing there is a problem. Okay. The second yep. demand is about accepting that the broad solution must be that we mm-hmm. need to cut emissions in line with the science, but to have net zero by 2025. And then the third demand is we don't trust you to do this. It's a way that we can keep our government held accountable throughout that process to make sure that that second demand is actually met. Mm-hmm. So as of now in Australia, Scott Morrison, what is what do you think about Mm. the government mm. right now mm. on this climate action. Yeah, yeah. I mean, our, our, our current government is taking us backwards on climate change. Mm-hmm. They have shown a blatant dis- disregard for the suffering of Pacific Islanders and um, have not prioritised even the, the climate talks, mm-hmm. um, opting to, to not attend. So the government currently... and. Listen, I'm not. We are a non-partisan organisation. Labor and um, even the Greens, to an extent, aren't where they need to be on this issue. But definitely, our current government is not accepting the facts, not accepting what the, the scientists are telling us, not accepting the, the emergency as it is. Um, and we need to see them acting in a swift way. Mm. So, how is how the XR the Extinction Rebellion started? How it started is that because of these um, climate um, issues? Yeah, yeah. So Extinction Rebellion started in the UK um, as a response to a lot of just deadlock around the climate issue. There's, there's been we've known about you know global warming for 30 years. The climate crisis has been very astoundingly clear for the last 10. The science is there yet the action in our wider society isn't seen. And that's happened for a myriad of reasons, but one of them is that the current ways of traditional um, awareness raising and Mm -hmm. protest haven't been effective in moving the narrative forward. So we've seen petitions fall on deaf ears. We've seen, you know, rallies of thousands of people be ignored by governments. Extinction Rebellion comes out, sees that, and goes, it's time, this is an emergency, and we need to start acting as if it's an emergency. Uh, it is an emergency. It's time to start disrupting business as usual until this issue is taken seriously. 
because it is existential. Our civilization will not be able to survive through a hot house earth scenario as it is. So we're re right now in this next 10 year period, we're making decisions about how me and my kids will live. And it's important to be, you know, to be very acutely aware of that. So who, who are the Extinction Rebellion? Is that me, you, or? Yeah, yeah, so well, there's, there's many people who are, you know, involved in Extinction Rebellion in various ways. They're basically everyday folk. We're a fully volunteer organization that is fully grassroots led. So there are no hierarchical leaders. You know, there are no people in the UK saying, this is what you should do in South Australia. Extinction Rebellion South Australia all decide how Extinction Rebellion South Australia works. And it's very clear and very, you know, grounded in what we need. Um, I guess we are also, many of us people, you know, with lives and with, with families. So there is a, there is a kind of extensive, there's, there's an amount of flux, as in all volunteer organisations. Um, but yeah, there's a core, ba core base of us of about a thousand strong so far. We started in January this year, so we're doing pretty well. So it's now growing? Yep. Yep, and we saw significant growth after our Spring Rebellion as well. Mm. So what do you think is the difference of Extinction Rebellion to other climate change groups? Because mm. you, your strategic is different, like disrupted mm. civil disobedience. Mm. So what is that the core strategy of Extinction Rebellion apart from other yeah, environmental yeah. groups? Totally, totally. So Extinction, the core of Extinction Rebellion's strategy and tactics relies on civil disobedience. That is our main way of drawing attention to this issue. Um, and so that, that's chosen for a myriad of reasons. There are a couple of key ones, though, in that civil disobedience is our final, like it's the final tool in the toolbox. You know, we've tried the other stuff. When you engage and break laws and say that I'm not going to obey the police, I'm going to sit on this road until... You, ha you forcibly take remove me and I'm going to disrupt whatever's happening around me until then. There's a sense where you are forcing the issue to be played out in, the, in, in society, right? Mm -hmm. And we, in Extinction Rebellion, we don't do that lightly. We don't take our disruption lightly. We are always thinking about the most respectful way to do it and the most um, impactful way to do it. We're not just here to, you know, faff to disrupt people's lives for no reason. We're here because we have 10 years, you know. It's not, a sh it's not an easy ask. We need to, a full, like, mobilisation on the scale of, like, wartime mobilisations around, you know, Hitler in World War II. Like, this is a significant challenge to the Australian way of life. And we are currently, the, the society that we live in is ignoring it. And we need to be able to have that full, like, have a conversation about it and work out, work out a way forward together extinction rebellion is just forcing that conversation to be had now in a way that um in the best way that we possibly can by being disruptive instead of by playing the traditional game and potentially being ignored do you, you say disruptive or civil or civil disobedience mm. is that any risk to your future supporter mm. because of what you're doing you disrupting their daily lives. So, for example, I see in you South Australia that you lay lying on inside in front of the street or something or run the mall. Mm, is mm. that what? What do you think about it? If is this going to be a risk to future supporter because because of that their lives is disruptive? So, what do you say about that? Mm. People, everyday people are going to be disrupted mm -hmm. in the way, when, whenever we take action. Um, and I, like, I don't take that lightly. I'm willing, to, I'm not getting on the road just to play silly buggers, you know. I'm willing to go to jail for this because, and many people in Extinction Rebellion are, because this is a, an issue that is going to have significant impact on my life. I've already seen places that I used to love visiting 
be completely you know, ripped apart by drought. The Chris, Christie's Creek, the creek I used to play in as a kid, is empty and it hasn't had water in it for multiple years. Those places that used to be so powerful and create so much wonder within me have disappeared. And they're just gonna, it's just going to get worse. Droughts are going to get more intense. Bushfires are going to be more, you know, more intense and more frequent. So we are disrupting people, but we hope that in many of them, we'll see that the greater value of this disruption is worth the, you know, the half an hour they spend in traffic or the couple of minutes that we spend swarming an intersection. And in our, in our really disruptive actions, we found that often it's about 50-50. 50% of the people will be like, yeah, I can see why you're here and I agree with you. I'm happy to wait. And then the other 50% of people will be a bit pissed off. You know, understandably, you know, we all have our own lives. Um, I just hope that maybe after the action, when after the heat of the moment, they can see why we're there. So w what is your message to the 50 half? Mm, the that, ones that disagree? Yeah, disagree with that. What, what, mm. is your, what is the message of Extinction Rebellion about to them? To them? Yeah. Um, we're living in an, in an emergency situation. We need to take evasive action. We have 10 years to completely reorient the way that we, our food systems work, the way our transport systems work. This is not a joke, you know? And I'm not just doing this for me. I'm not just doing it for the animals. I'm doing it for everyone's kids, you know? We've seen huge high school mobilizations in the last year because of that exact thing. People of my generation and younger, we feel this on a visceral level. This is going to affect my life. I'm going to, like... There is a real potential that by the time I'm 60 or 70, mm -hmm. I'll be living in... You know, I'll be living in a place that can't grow food anymore, where water scarcity is the norm and not just something that you hear about in other countries. You know, I'm fighting for my future, for, for my future right now, you know. And so I hope that on some level you can empathize with that, even if you remain pissed off with me personally. <laughs> and I'm happy to have a conversation with you if you see me on the street. <laughs> So you, you're trying to educate people about what really happening right now yeah. by doing the civil disobedience. Yeah, yeah. And every point in history when social change has occurred, there has not been unanimous agreement about that social change. You mm -hmm. know, when women were fighting for the vote, there were lots of people who were, you know, there was a significant portion of the population who didn't think that they should get the vote. Social change is always tricky. There's always going to be pushback. So for me, I don't have to be liked by everyone. Mm -hmm. I just have to see that my, my actions are having a significant effect on, effect on the actual narrative. If we're talking about climate change more, and if that narrative is out there in a big way, then I'm doing my job. I don't have to be liked by every motorist that is stopped at an action. Mm -hmm. So how did you... How did you join the Extinction Rebellion? I am... Um, Is that one of the... Um, friend invited you here? So how... Why... How did you join? Why... why basically, why do you join Extinction Rebellion? Um, I've, like, I've been involved in climate activism for like a, a while, probably like six or seven years mm -hmm. since I was in a teenager. Um, you know, I did a lot of stuff around trying to get solar thermal in Port Augusta, rallies and petitions and they, it, it was a long process and a slow process and I've seen, I've seen Australia build to some sort of action on climate change and then all of that disappear. So for me personally, I felt quite despondent, quite apathetic, like I didn't really have a voice or ability to change the system I was living in um, at the start of the year. Um, very disillusioned with like traditional ways and someone invited me to a Heading for Extinction talk um, and I went along and yeah, civil disobedience is powerful. There's not many times in history where civil disobedience hasn't been used as part of significant social movements. If you look at like the black, you know, civil rights in the US, mm -hmm. 
if you look at you know, Gandhian independence in India, even the suffragette movement in the 90s, it, like, it managed to oust a dictator, the Arab Spring, Hong Kong even. There are many ways that civil disobedience can be very powerful and much more powerful than signing a petition or potentially just marching. Those are all necessary, but they're not, they're not getting the, the, the sufficient traction they need to be able to really fight this thing. I, for me personally, civil disobedience, non-violent, civil disobedience is the only way forward in my mind. Do you think, Jamie, is that it's about time to the government uh, to incorporate this type of information, climate change, to school as part of the curriculum so that they know what's happening to, the, to our planet? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I'm not actually super familiar with the current curriculum. I know that climate change is mentioned in some capacity. I would really like to see schools come out in stronger support for the school strikers, perhaps, because it is really, in, especially in that teenage generation, you know, the people in school year 10, year 11, year 12 right now, they are really worried, you know. Talk to them. Whenever you, when you, whenever you start a conversation with someone of that age about climate change, there is so much emotion there, you know. If you actually understand what the science, the implications of the science are, you'd be emotional too, you know. I feel like if they can't, they, I, I would suggest that if, maybe not, I mean, government can change their curriculum, great, that'd be awesome. But definitely schools coming out in support of the school strikes and allowing faculty and full classrooms to go would be, would be a great step forward. Mm. So what is your message to everyone? So to them, what, what is your message to them right now um, as part of the Extinction Rebellion? So yeah, I, I would say action needs to happen now. We have, the, the, you know, the, the clock is ticking. We have very, very small amount of time to take real action. And I would suggest that all of you come and join our organization. Come and help us build a civil disobedience movement that can really challenge our current system so that this issue is discussed in a robust way and we can take full and effective action towards a sustainable future where we can all be safe and happy. Um, and that doesn't necessarily involve getting on the street. There are many ways that you can be involved in Extinction Rebellion's organisation and not be the one being arrested. But if you want to be arrested, I welcome you too. <laughs> I'll be there with you. What do you think about um, the young activist Greta? Mm. Is she so brave to talk about climate change? And what, what do you think about him? Mm. It's been well, like it's an impressive moment, isn't it? Greta Thunberg sits on Parliament House. Yeah. And a year later, 19,000 people come out and walk in Adelaide, you know? So I, I respect her immensely and I respect her ability to take a lot of the the hate that has been like aimed at her personally. She's become a, a pretty big target for a lot of the conservative media and the, the kind of the coal lobbies um, media arm. So well, more power to her, honestly. And I feel like anything that I've experienced in my life pales in comparison to the amount of pressure that Greta might be feeling at any given day. So good on her for keeping on fighting and getting out there, you know? So on this Extinction Rebellion, as I was right, because I was looking on all your program, there's a Spring Rebellion, and there is, what is DNA Talk? Mm. So the DNA Workshop is basically like a, an induction into XR. Who are we? How do we actually operate on a day-to-day -day basis? And then it goes through our 10 values and principles as well. Extinction Rebellion is a very... Um, it doesn't have many leaders. It is not very hierarchical, mostly because we recognise that there is lots to do and not much time to do it. The less we can have leaders and traditional power structures getting in the way of action, the better. So the, the main way that we actually organise together in a collective direction is by following those 10 principles and values. Everyone in XR, if you'd like to be part of XR, should come along to one of those talks to really get a grip on what those are and see if they fit with your own personal values and how you might fit into our organization as a whole. So last question uh, before we wrap up. What is your message to the government in Australia? 
and even in South Australia. So what, what is your message to them? We need action now. There's no time to waste. Come out, declare climate emergency, and commit to 2025 emissions, net zero emissions by 2025, because that's what we need to be doing, and that's what will mean our country prospers for the next 50 to 100 years. All right. Thank you so much, Jamie. Um, thank you for uh, different guests right now. So usually we, our guests are different so part, of, uh, part of society. So thank you so much for guesting to our podcast, The Fresh Eyes uh, Guerrilla Podcast. Um, thank you so much. No worries, man. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the invite. <laughs> thank you so much. So... Thank you for listening and watching. So see you next week again for another episode of Guerrilla Podcast, Fresh Eyes. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe so you're notified when a new episode is posted in Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, or via RSS. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, rate and review this podcast and share it with your friends. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. And if you want to know more, check out kangaroofern.com.